So uh, welcome everybody to uh, our event, uh, looking at the results from Israel's election, uh, which happened on Tuesday. We're joined, uh, as we have now, for three elections in a row, although for the second time in just a few months, by uh, the former president of the New Israel Fund and deputy speaker of the Knesset, Nomi Chazan. Uh, before we get to her, uh, I want to give a little bit of an introduction to uh, what's been happening, which was a, a bit of a, an interesting and uh, maybe even a breakthrough election result. Uh, and we're going to dive into that in a second. Uh, before we get to the results, I just thought I'd provide a little bit of context to how the, um, uh, how the kind of campaign went over the last couple of days, over the last couple of months. Uh, and even looking back before the last election. So in December, Netanyahu called an election for April, uh, and that campaign was marked by an announcement from the Attorney General that Netanyahu would face indictment hearings on corruption charges. That was one of the main topics of discussion in April's campaign. Uh, and we also uh, saw some very desperate attempts by him and some very controversial attempts uh, to talk about annexation of uh, Jewish settlements in the West Bank, uh, and also to include Kahanists, Jewish supremacists, in what he hoped would be his next coalition. New candidates entered that campaign as well in April, including a number of former senior military officials, like Benny Gantz, who started a blue and white party, a kind of centre, some would say centre-right uh, party that he merged with Yair Lapid and his uh, Yeshatid party. Just as the, the result ended from that election in a little bit of a, uh, what seemed like an obvious right-wing religious coalition, that would be built by Benjamin Netanyahu. At the last minute, though, Avigdor Lieberman, the head of the Israel Beitano party, balked. He wanted to advance secular nationalist interests. I think he also wanted to poke uh, Netanyahu in the eye a little bit and make things difficult. And so he said he wouldn't join a coalition with the Haredim. Uh, and so instead of risking another candidate being tasked with forming a coalition, Netanyahu sent Israelis back to elections, which, like I said, finally happened yesterday. And that campaign that just wrapped up was run on very similar terms to April's, and the results have also been somewhat similar. Uh, there were very similar themes in, in both election campaigns. A dominant one, from our perspective certainly, was the continued assault on liberal democratic ideas, including race baiting against Israel's Arab minority, including attempts to suppress their votes, uh, attacks on the justice system, and attacks on the media. Uh, so in that regard, it was quite nasty. Uh, I thought I would share with you before, like I said, we go to NOMI, share with you some of the results uh, from the election that have come through. Uh, as you can see, the latest, just from a couple of hours ago, is that Blue and White, the Benny Gunsled party, uh, has 33 seats to Likud's 31. The joint list, the joint Arab list, is the third largest party with 13 seats. The ultra-Orthodox parties, Shas and United Torah Judaism, have nine and eight seats. Uh, Avigdor Lieberman's Israel Beitano has eight. Yamina, the party of the right wing led by Ayelet Shaked, the former justice minister, has seven. Labour and Gesher uh, have six seats. And then the Democratic Union, which is uh, Meretz plus Stav Shafir, formerly of Labour, and Ehud Barak, of course, a former Labour prime minister, have five seats. And I thought I would include this interesting slide, which shows some of the changes from this election to April and even back to 2015 as well. Um, you can see some marked changes, particularly the demise of Labour and obviously the growth of the Blue and White Party. The ultra-Orthodox have stayed relatively similar. Uh, Yisrael Beitano gained a number of seats between this election and April off the back of his campaigning on secular issues uh, that obviously was the, the catalyst for the second election campaign. Um, whereas uh, Meretz uh, was able to kind of maintain their representation. In fact, to increase it really by one since April. Um, I thought I'd also show the breakdown of the obvious coalitions, which even though Abigdor Lieberman is certainly a, a right wing figure, I've separated him out because of his demand that there be a national unity secular government. Uh, as you can see, the center left has grown a little bit since four years ago. The right absence Lieberman has shrunk, although when you include Lieberman, it's a very similar size. Uh, and the Arab parties in this election have gained the seats they lost in April. In April's election, they ran as separate parties, whereas in this election, they ran uh, together again as the joint list. And so they are back up uh, to 13 seats. Um, we're going to 
pass on now before I give you over to Nomi, I thought I would just say a couple of things. One is that uh, this is obviously a very interactive um, uh, a very interactive event. So if you have your questions, uh, you can ask them if you're joining via Zoom. You can join them. Uh, you can just ask them by clicking the Q&A box, uh, which is uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, or if you're joining on Facebook Live, you can just type your comment in. We'll keep track and we'll, uh, we'll get to answering your questions. So with that, I'll pass on to Nomi uh, and let her give us a, an update uh, and then we'll go to some discussion. So Nomi, thank you very much for joining us and uh, over to you. It's my pleasure. Uh, good evening. It's uh, midday here in Jerusalem. And I want to make a, a major suggestion for the next uh, webinar. You don't need to call in outside to help. Liam is terrific. <laughs> and because he's so terrific, he's uh, cut about 10 minutes from my presentation. <laughs> And we'll be able to get, I hope, within 20 minutes to a to serious discussion because uh, I think that's the reason we're here. Uh, I want to do uh, three things. I'll, I'll go over very briefly some other points regarding the election results. Uh, but keep in mind the magnificent tables that Liam just pre presented. I will discuss where we go from here, if we go anywhere. And I will discuss some themes that all of us should have in mind when thinking about Israel, Israeli politics and Israeli society in, in, in the immediate next few years. Perhaps that's more important than anything else. And let me start by saying that um, the result of these elections, depending who you talk to, one hears for the past 24 hours almost the identical answer from the far right to the far left. The first part of the answer is it could have been worse. Regardless of one's perspective, it could have been worse. And the second part of the answer is, it could have been better. And again, from every single perspective, one hears that as well. And the third part of the answer is, we'll have to leave, live with it. It's very complicated. And one knows when to, one talks about politics that uh, complicated is a euphemism especially in the Israeli case, for uh, it's so complicated that we don't know how we're going to get out of this quagmire. And I think it's important to remember that it is going to be not only complicated, but as I will reiterate in a few minutes, it's going to be very tedious. It's going to be so tedious that most people who care about Israel are not going to be able to keep up with the details and they'll find them so boring that it almost by definition it's going to be a, a turn off, but we'll get to that in a minute. I think that the bottom line from the election results as we know them today, and there will be a few adjustments I believe in the t next 24 hours, they're counting the soldiers' votes, the diplomats' votes, the seamen's votes, um, uh, the disabled votes now, and they're going to shift a little bit, a seat here, a seat there. But roughly speaking, the bottom line, and one has to understand that, is in terms of the two traditional blocks in the past few years in Israel, it's a stalemate. It's a deadlock. It's a dead heat. The right has somewhere between 54 to 56 seats. The center left has somewhere between 55 and 57 seats. And Mr. Lieberman 
that at this moment people find difficult to categorize has eight in the middle, although he probably, in terms of his general outlook, more on the right than he has on the left. Israel, in this election, proved once again that politically it's extremely polarized. And if you take this conclusion, in my opinion, you're only going half the way and not coming to the second conclusion of the results as we know them today. And I think they're within the range that Liam and I discussed because something else is going on here. There are two groups that were strengthened in these elections that are not natural candidates for coalition. Unless it would be a totally right-wing coalition or a totally left-wing coalition. And the two groups that were strengthened, first and foremost, the Arab community in Israel. It's back to 12, 13. I, I think it might be able to stick to the 13 a vast improvement over the April elections because the voter turnout in Arab polling booths was up 10% in September in contrast to April. In other words, when the Arab parties merge, they are a political force and very conceivably, according to Knesset rules, Ayman Uda, the head of the joint Arab list, will become the leader of the opposition. This is an amazing breakthrough in Israeli politics and requires to think more in terms of a joint society of all Israel citizens than perhaps in the past. So that's one major shift. The second uh, shift, we've seen it before, before but it re-emerged today. And by the way, one that hardly any of the commentators are noting is the strengthening of the ultra-Orthodox parties, the Haredi parties. They are now up to 17 seats. Chas especially gained in these elections, but together, Shaz and United Torah Judaism are 17 seats. That's a block. And it's a block somewhere on the right, but in a different place entirely. And if you've been following the rhetoric of uh, the past few days, and I'm sure many of you have been even more glued to the websites uh, than I have, then um, I think one understands that all those who've been talking about a Zionist Jewish government have been using this terminology as a veil to exclude Arabs. But the same veil could be used to exclude Haredim as well. So we have two blocks that are growing as opposed to a large body of Jewish Israelis that uh, are deadlocked. And that is the, at the moment, the most we can say about the election results as we know them. But I suggest to keep our minds open with these two takeaways. So that's as for the results, they're not going to change much. And therefore, the second major question that arises is, what's going to happen? Now, I, uh, like many of my friends, opened the Aretz this morning and saw seven or eight scenarios for coalition construction. Obviously, nobody, no side can form a government on its own, 
and therefore we have to look to two major options. I am going to put the first one on the table, even though it's surprising, and that is the first option is no government is formed, and Israel goes to a third set of elections. I'm putting it on the table now because it is not a distant possibility, given the numbers and the possible combinations, but, and it's important to remember, most people, that's the last thing they want. I don't think many people, friends and political foes, can go through another election with a venom that we saw in the past few weeks. It is absolutely tearing Israel asunder. And frankly, if you want a third takeaway from the elections, uh, people are sick of elections. And, and that's a deterrent, but don't forget it's an option also that no coalition will be constructed. And then the big threat dangling over the negotiators is going to be, if you don't get your heads together and if you don't get your act together, that's what's going to happen. And the voters are going to punish. They will. Okay, so the second option is obviously some form of coalition government with the highest probability at the moment being given to various forms of national unity governments. Now, um, a national unity government uh, will probably, it has to include labor, sorry, the Likud, and uh, Blue White Party of Benny Gantz, and that's where the problems begin. Benny Gantz has announced that he cannot sit with the Likud as long as its leader is uh, under suspicion and about to be charged with uh, a mixture of fraud and uh, embezzlement and, and bribery. Although in the last 24 hours, there have been some hints that they will be willing to sit with him in Delhi's charge. Um, from Netanyahu's side, Netanyahu side, signed on all the right, 55 parties, 55 seats, including the Haredim and the far right, on an agreement that they will only back Netanyahu, which applicates Netanyahu as well. So can Netanyahu actually fall back on his own agreement with a right-wing bloc? and join a national unity government, that will be seen as sheer betrayal. So to form a national unity government of the two major parties, Likud and Blue and White, means both sides have to compromise on their electoral promises. Now Lieberman is somewhere in the middle. He wants a national unity government, but he wants to be in it. And neither side is so excited about bringing him in, but they'll, they'll live with that if that could happen. But if Lieberman's in, no Haredi party can be in. And if Gantz is in, Netanyahu can't be in personally. And obviously no Arab representation. Now I went through this complicated uh, analysis and by the way, if you want, I can go option by option by option of various forms of national unity government and show you why each one of them is problematic. But it's easier for me to reverse the situation and say, what do I learn or what can we learn from the kinds of negotiations 
moderately reasonable options, no option is a, is a shoe in at the moment, that we, we have before us. What we can conclude, I think, is that the joint Arab list and probably uh, Meretz, the Democratic Union, are not going to be in a future government. They are going to be the core of the opposition of, on the left. And I would go one step further and speculate that at the moment, a national unity will be very difficult uh, to achieve with the Haredim in at the moment, at the moment. But the second conclusion from the current negotiations, they're only starting, is um, that Israel is in a systemic deadlock. That means the Israeli political system requires something to give. And the key word I would use today is everybody's going to have to compromise if something is going to work. So please put in front of your eyes the word compromise, and it's going to be extraordinarily painful. But if compromise is the name of the game, and by the way, I would pretty much insist at this stage that politically compromise is the name of the game. If compromise is the key word and the key sentiment that we have to look at, it might be very interesting politically because this kind of compromise can break the polarization that has characterized Israel for the past decade. And I cannot begin to describe to you how harmful, how destructive, how damaging polarization is in democracies. It totally undermines anything, anything that makes it possible for people to attach themselves to the system. So, um, if there was one thing that worried me more during the election campaign than anything else, it wasn't the ugly racist exclusionary rhetoric. I expected that. We've had 10 years of experience with it. What worried me to the core was that certain individuals including the prime minister, were willing a priori to cast doubt on the legitimacy of the results of the election in order to gain votes. And when you cast doubt about at the, on the legitimacy of elections, you are questioning the very basics of democracy. And that is so, so dangerous. So we have the possibility here of a reshuffle of a large center, a fairly large left, <clears throat> and a not insignificant ultra-Orthodox component as well. But structurally, it changes the political map from two blocks to something a little different <clears throat> and gives a fair amount of wiggle room. Having said that, I want to therefore just proceed and say, what, do, what should we be looking at in Israel in the next few months and perhaps years as key themes? <clears throat> I'd like to suggest to you, first of all, some subjects. I think um, the question of tolerance and respect for the other, other opinions, 
other mindsets, other wor worldviews, is going to keep coming up. And by the way, if it's a national unity government, that is the adhesive of national unity governments. We will hear that. And, and I find that actually quite um, refreshing. It's the last thing we've heard, except from certain elements, progressive forces in Israel in recent years. <clears throat> the second thing we will see more and more on the psychedelic that will come up increasingly is, I think, the question of Israel's future relations with the Palestinians, because any national unity government will be thoroughly divided on that issue. And therefore, it, civil society will have to re-raise it, because in all probability, one of the key factors in the situation that we have today politically is the fact that this issue is not resolved and it is eating away at the core of Israeli society. And we will see a tremendous amount of movement on issues that people don't disagree with. Traffic jams, the health system, education, and the like. So that's for topics. But I'm more concerned with themes because most people fixate on the tom topics and don't pay enough attention to the theme. The, the thir first theme that's coming up already, partly, is a theme of what do we do with our political system? If it's dysfunctional, how do we fix it? I, I've heard uh, too many comments in the last 24 hours we have to change the electoral system. Uh, that's one of the areas that I've written some very boring articles, academic articles, which I do not recommend to anybody. Uh, but here I, I do have to say something important. And that is when you start tampering with your electoral system, you don't know where it's going to take you and Israel's one experience with that, which was direct elections of the prime minister, was very close to a disaster. So I would caution against that. But not enough attention is being given to the key issue, and that it is fortifying Israel's democratic institutions. And the key erosion in recent years. And here I go back to my opening statement. The boring questions of who are the gatekeepers? What is the role of the courts? What checks and balances exist in the system? Most of them have been removed or thoroughly weakened in the last few years. And they're going to have to be resurrected because without a written constitution it's easy to destroy the constitutional foundations and the checks and balances and i know you just fell asleep you went to get a cup of coffee please don't strong constitutions with built-in rules and checks and balances and strong oppositions are the key to fairly stable democracies. They don't deteriorate. So on the level of the political system, the main theme is going to be structural and institutional and those of you who have a mind for those issues, put on your thinking hats, it's very important. The second major theme is going to relate to civil society and the role of civil society organizations, and or if you want to put it in stronger terms, people power. 
what can individuals and groups do now to contribute to making this a more tolerant, interactive, inclusive society for all the citizens of Israel? That question is a key NIF question, but it's going to be a key Israeli question as well. Because trying to exclude creates in inner tensions that are unsustainable over time. I think some of the joint uh, Jewish Arab work, shared society work is an example, but Ethiopian Israelis and Sabras is another example. And yes, frankly, religious and secular is going to have to be another avenue that we're going to have to examine much more carefully. And the final point is, we have been saying in progressive circles in Israel, the New Israel Fund has been saying, look at the erosion of Israeli democracy. It's happening before our eyes. And until we begin to understand the parameters of these changes, further changes have occurred and we're way behind this democratic slippage. These elections prove that without a vibrant, deep democracy in Israel, Israel will find itself in a situation that it won't be able to support itself and how it operates, let alone promote its values. And therefore, more and more and more attention is going to have to be given to thinking out of the box and assuming a national unity government based on compromise. Thinking out of the box about how to begin to put Israel's Humpty Dumpty democracy together again and that is also going to be a major theme. I'll stop here and let's talk. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that uh, really amazing summary, Nomi. Um, it's definitely uh, covered lots of the questions uh, that I've seen coming through so far. Uh, I want to, most of the questions that we've had have broken down into two categories roughly. One is a kind of procedural slash coalition building category and the other is a policy and, and where we go from here policy wise category. So I thought I might bundle some of the procedural questions together first so that you can kind of tick those boxes and then we'll move on to on some of the more tachless questions. So one question we had was whether uh, it's possible that some Likud members could split away from the party and effectively serve as independent in a national unity government, even if Bibi is unwilling to himself. Um, another question, I'll kind of bundle them together and then maybe you can answer all of them at once. Uh, another is whether uh, you foresee a kind of split term prime minister where, you know, Bibi might get two years, then Gantz might get two years or the other way around. Um, or, or maybe Lieberman will insist on having uh, a term as prime minister as part of being part of the government. Um, uh, another uh, interesting procedural question uh, is the, uh, so, so let me, let me pivot a little bit. The, the compromise question was an interesting one. We said eventually some people are going to have to compromise. Is it possible that actually Lieberman will be the one most likely to compromise if he's given something substantial by Netanyahu and will end up with the right wing religious coalition that Bibi would prefer? Like, is that perhaps the easiest compromise or the most natural compromise that you could see happening? Let's start with those and then we can uh, answer some more. Okay, I'll take them in order so as not to forget them. Um, the uh, prospect of raiding, that means Gantz raids some Likud members, has, has come up at the margins, but what's more, much more, uh, what's being discussed much more seriously 
is the Likud rating, some of the blue and white, especially the right wing, ex-Likud segment of blue and white, uh, Gidon Hauser and Yoaz Hendel, who were close advisors of Netanyahu, or for that matter, uh, Bogi Alon, who was his defense minister, etc. Et By the way, rating is a polite way of uh, translating the term that's being used in Hebrew, and that's cannibalizing. And yes, everybody is talking about that, but barring the fact that um, uh, there's a massive shift from one party to another, I there will be one or two defections in each side, maybe, but I'm not sure they're enough to tip the balance. And if they are, they would create such a fragile government that it'd be impossible to stay in power for long. But that's happening all the time. This, the, every hour there'll be a new rumor about who is considering crossing the aisle, which is the very correct terminology <laughs> process we're talking about. And if I may, I'll skip to the third question on Lieberman. Lieberman at the moment is the balance of power. He knows that. He's thoroughly enjoying himself. He, he hasn't closed the door for tipping the balance for a right-wing government, but the cost to Netanyahu would be immense. At the moment, he's biding his time. He's one of the best, most crafty politicians in Israel and he's going to wait uh, until he can get as much as possible out of the system. Uh, I don't think he'll be prime minister because he doesn't have the numbers. No. He's, got, he's got eight seats at the moment. That I don't see any more coming in, which leaves us with the rotation question. Look, any national unity government is going to be based on rotation. There's no question about it. The only interesting question is the one I can't answer, and that is, who's first? And uh, who's first? At, at the moment, Gantz is going to insist that he goes first, which puts Netanyahu out of the prime minister's office. And, and we, we do have to recall that a prime minister does not have to resign if charged, if put up, indicted on criminal charges, but a minister, according to law, does have to resign. So Netanyahu's do or die battle today is I have to stay in the prime minister's office because as soon as I'm not, I'm out. And that's exactly, not the rotation, there's going to be rotation. The question is the identity of the first of the two. I saw a lot of commentary today saying that there would be a lot of mistrust between Gantz and and Bibi, and that Bibi would not trust Gantz to go first and then just uh, dissolve the, the, the Knesset after two years and vice versa. Um, Gantz wouldn't trust Bibi to go first and then after two years he would dissolve it. I, I, I'm shaking my hands because I would say those are very interesting questions, but they disregard the legal situation of the prime minister. And there's no way that that the, uh, the Likud could go into national unity government today if Netanyahu is not first, because then he hasn't achieved anything. And therefore, the, part of this chess game is exactly the identity the first, uh, of the first. Uh, so, so that kind of dovetails into one of the questions that we got from Leslie, okay. which goes right to the core of um, 
of this question of immunity, which was a law that Netanyahu pushed very hard to uh, to pass, um, you know, as part of the coalition negotiations after April's election. Do you see any coalition makeup, assuming that it won't be a, a kind of right wing religious government that Lieberman eventually joins? Is there any coalition makeup in which Bibi does get that immunity law? Okay, I'll answer that, but I just one more uh, comment. Sure. You know, national unity governments are not foreign to Israel. The most unlikely government, and actually on certain issues quite successful, especially economic issues, was the Shamir Peres Coalition National Unity Government, which included over 90 members of NASA at the time. And, and these two uh, former uh, prime ministers couldn't stomach each other. They couldn't even stay in the same room at the beginning. But they did succeed in uh, serving out the term and in doing the rotation. So again, to think of this as a remote possibility is, is going about the analysis in the wrong way. One has to focus on the analysis and see where the problems are. On the question of the immunity, part of the problem forming a coalition in April was that Netanyahu wanted to sign all potential partners on a new immunity law. But to tell you the truth, you don't need a new immunity law. The immunity law for members of Knesset today says uh, that the immunity, if, if a member of Knesset is charged with, with a criminal offense, um, the attorney general will strip him of immunity unless he asks that member of Knesset, asks the, the parliament to, to grant him immunity. So a member of Knesset has the option of being granted immunity by, by the Knesset at his behest. And this is being used all the time to say, Bibi raised the topic when he has protection, assuming he's a member of Knesset and not a minister. And therefore, if you look very carefully between the lines, Bibi's option is to be a prime minister or a member of Knesset, but not a minister, because then he'd have to resign. So people are looking at those two options yeah. because an, the immunity law can protect him as a member of Knesset from um, a, a criminal trial. So let's um, let's move into an area we've got quite a few questions around um, the significance and strength of uh, the joint Arab list, uh, which is looks like it'll receive about thirteen seats um there's a couple of questions right so there's a couple of questions that circulate here which is one what what do you think is the what's the signal that having such a strong arab vote sends to jewish israelis or all israelis especially given the incitement against the arab israeli community um from a number of politicians um but right at the top including and especially the prime minister um who said who kind of even went even further than perhaps some thought possible. Um, and not only what's the signal of having such a strong block in parliament, but what happens if there is a unity government and the Arab list becomes the largest non-coalition party where Ayman Odeh would then effectively be leader of the opposition and as part of that would have access to security briefings and other kind of formal roles that, that he may not have had before. Is that even realistic or would the other parties not in the coalition conspire to deny him that role? Um, and again, what does, you know, um, Jabotinsky wrote about having a vice premier who was an Arab Israeli where there was a Jewish prime minister. Uh, actually, I thought it was Theodore Herzl. Well, okay, Herzl. 
I, I think I think it was certainly not an uncommon theme. Um, and so, how you know how do, how would that actually be read by um, Jewish Israelis? Do you think? Uh, okay, uh, uh, let me try to at least elaborate a little on the reactions to the strong. Uh, um, showing of the joint Arab list at the boat. And you're right. On, uh, uh, in government, present government circles, and especially Netanyahu, the rise of, of representation of the Arab list has been used as a way of repeating racist slurs of the worst sort. And I point you or anybody who wants to go deeper into this issue to read a translation of his speech at about 4 a.m. Uh, after the first results were uh, published. And he talks about anti-Zionist are forming. How can Anybody give support to a coalition based on anti-Zionist parties who preach for the destruction of Israel. Now, somebody who lost at least nine seats in this election, speaking that way about a party that succeeded in bringing out a dormant Arab vote, and doing quite well at the polls. It's, it's outrageous. It's a continuation of the slur of the Arabs are going in droves to the polls, come out, et cetera, et cetera, that we heard back in 2015. So you do get this reaction <laughs> on the one hand. On the other hand, in most circles, and I'll give you one example. There's an understanding, a very um, considered, objective assessment that the Arab community in Israel is proving to be a political force that cannot be ignored. And if I want to give one proof of that, uh, Amir Peretz, the head of the Labour Party, uh, much reduced, yesterday issued a call to Benny Gantz to talk to Ayman Ode to start talk discussions with the leadership of the Joint Arab List. And I think that is the kind of awakening, positive awakening, that may begin to shift sentiments. It'll take a long time. But nevertheless, I think I see that beginning to happen. And that leads directly into who's going to be head of the next opposition. I hinted at that, right? And by the way, the role of leader of the opposition is embedded in law. It comes with regular monthly consultations with the prime minister, regularly, regular security briefings, a regular place in all state functions and official ceremonies. It's, it was built at the time, by the way, to accommodate Ariel Sharon when he was leader of the Likud. Wow. And it, it, it's lasted for the past 20 years. It won't be changed, I don't know. And my hunch is that he will get enough. Um, he is the third party. There's no question of it. Ayman Ode leads the third largest party in Israel, any which way you look at it. And it, he will be the natural choice for leader of the opposition. I already began to see this morning murmurs in the direction of how can we let him 
expose him to state secrets. You know, people's memory is so short that it's amazing. It's only the older people who are supposed to be getting senile that seem to have a longer memory. But I sat on the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee with at least two representatives, different times, of our parties. There's nothing new in that, okay? Nothing. And so to, to think that it is a major innovation is it's just to show one's memory lapses more than anything else. Will... <laughs> Well, let me just say what it's dependent yeah. on, and, 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 and I'll end there. Who is going to be the head of the opposition it depends how many people, how many parties, what the numbers are on the opposition, in the opposition on both sides. Uh, if Meretz and, uh, and the Joint Arab List are in the opposition, and uh, the... Uh, Ultra Orthodox who are in the opposition, together with Yamina, the right wing party, the right wing party has the numbers. The right wing opposition has the numbers. So I, the answer is going to be obvious as soon as we know who's in and out of the coalition. Um, like you said, um, Amir Peretz called for Benny Gantz to include. Uh, or at least to have a meeting with Ayman Oda and the joint list. And Benny Gantz has been receptive, says they spoke and that they will meet in the coming days, I think. Um, David's asked the question, what do you suppose will be there, either demands to join the coalition led by Gantz, or at least to support it from outside the government? What will um, Ayman Oda and I think um, Ahmed Tibi also made public comments in the last couple of days. What will their demands be, do you think? Actually, the list of demands was published before the elections. And it has two very clear parts. One is the beginning of negotiations on a two-state solution with the Palestinians based on the 1967 lines, permanent boundaries, uh, sharing Jerusalem, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Pretty much the Clinton, the old Clinton parameters. <laughs> um, uh, so that's part one and part two, but with equal weight, mind you, is a serious investment in in uh, upgrading housing, uh, education, infrastructure in the Arab community, especially in Arab towns and villages, with a special emphasis on what most uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel can consider the scourge of their society internally, and that is violence, violence and violence. The big Arab cities, Omer Fakhrim, Shvaram, Sakhnin are extremely violent and they, they are begging for the restoration of order. So these are very concrete uh, demands that, will, that have been raised again. I don't think they'll be changed. These are, the various components of the joint list are in one way or another committed to this to these issues, except Balad, which doesn't want to be part of any coalition anyway, etc. So uh, those are pretty much what, th that's pretty much what they would ask for. But again, don't hold your breath, because there is not a left, center-left coalition with the Arabs. That doesn't include Lieberman at the moment, or one of the Haredi parties, the numbers don't add up. And can I at least say one thing? The last two nights, and I assume next two months, because it's going to take two months, um, I go to sleep dreaming 61, 61, 61. I wake up in the morning dream saying 61, 61. We're at the mathematic stage of Israeli politics and the magic number 
is 61. And if I'm at it just on the procedural matters, this is a game of patience. Netanyahu invited Gantz an hour ago to meet with him. Gantz has no interest in speeding up negotiations. The hearing for Netanyahu is right after Rosh Hashanah. He doesn't want to talk to him before Rosh Hashanah because any deal struck between now and Rosh Hashanah goes in Netanyahu's faith. It's going to be a chicken, a game of chicken, of brinkmanship. And the first person to blink is the first one who's going to lose. Um, very high stakes game of chicken, I think. The, um, one of the things you mentioned uh, that I'll, I'll kind of take and run with is uh, the joint list demand for a two-state solution and for an active and honest engagement with uh, the Palestinians in Ramallah. So from there, you can draw a line policy-wise to Netanyahu's pre-election pledge uh, and also which he made before the previous election as well and has hinted at over the years many times um, around annexation of some or all of the West Bank. His particular proposal uh, a couple of weeks ago was around uh, sections, large sections of the Jordan Valley, um, which would include a number of settlements uh, and also about 10,000, I think, Palestinians in the area as well. And so what would happen to them around citizenship is a question. So I, I just want you to unpick how realistic it is, actually you think that if it is a Netanyahu-led government or even a Gantz-led government would actively pursue some form of annexation and what the impact of that is on any future negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians and for that matter, the impact on Israeli democracy itself. In two minutes. Yeah, or less. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and do it in, in, in less if I can. I, I made very clear that one of the substantive issues to look at is the question of occupation, precisely because of your question. Um, it, it's not a question, it wasn't an issue of political preference or anything like that. Intriguingly, a national unity government begs the Palestinian issue because the differences between the parties and the national unity government is especially around these issues, okay? And um, therefore, they will be discussed more. That's one reason. But secondly, because now that annexation has begun to occur, it's not a question of managing the conflict anymore. It's a question of either reaching some kind of understanding with the Palestinians or Israeli control over the entire West Bank and possibly even Gaza. And if that happens, Israel takes control, then there will be a Palestinian majority on the land, and Israel will be something quite different than what we know. So those are op these are big op options, not small options. And that's why this subject is going to have to be revisited as soon as we know the uh, composition of the coalition if it is formed and uh, and one can expect such a coalition to be able to act on these issues they didn't in the past and I doubt if we'll be able to do so in the future all right. Well, uh, that is definitely something to watch both, again, policy-wise in terms of uh, the makeup of the coalition. So I think we're going to leave it there as we reach 8.30. Um, I want to thank everyone. We've had uh, a lot of people joining both uh, via the webinar and on Facebook. So I want to thank everyone for being part of 
this and for submitting your questions. I want to thank Nomi, who uh, I think we got in first when we asked uh, when we asked you to do this webinar with us. But she's actually doing a second webinar later you in the day. You always get it first, <laughs> right? Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we you're, you're our staple election analyst, so it's very important that I, I notify you early. Um, she's doing another one later for the uh, uh, North American and British uh, NIF branches. So I want to thank you for doing this twice and, and for carving out the time for us. Uh, I want to say also just before we wrap up that we've got some really great events coming up at the end of the year. Uh, so if you want to save the date in Sydney on the 26th of November and in Melbourne on the 1st of December, these are going to be uh, dealing with the very important political issues that we've dealt with now from someone who's really on the inside uh, and we'll be announcing uh, who that speaker is soon. Uh, we're very excited uh, uh, to have them come uh, to Australia. It'll be their first visit and I think it's someone that uh, everyone will want to hear from as we look forward to how it is that we protect Israel's uh, liberal democratic values and make sure that we're strengthening everything that we love about Israel as an inclusive, pluralist and equal society. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. Thank you everyone for continuing to support NIF. Thank and you. May I just say Shana Toba, your tell. And thank you so much. I'm your biggest fan out there in Australia. <laughs> well, thank, we would love to have you again if you can uh, bear the schlep out here. Um, uh, there's always an open invitation for you. But in the meantime, we'll, uh, we'll welcome you via webinar and Facebook. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Shana Tova, also from us, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much.